What's up, guys? Excited to share with you guys this morning. Day three, Future Quest, first session. This is normally when a lot of us like hit a wall. Like we've hardly slept the last two nights. We're all excited, stayed up way too late. I sat with a group of students in the coffee bar this morning that told me they went to sleep at like four o'clock in the morning this morning. And I was like, that's just like poor planning. This is the last day. Like we still have to go hard before this day is over. So I hope you guys are awake with me. I hope you guys can rally because I think God has some good stuff for you guys in store today. Um, this is my 19th future quest that I've gotten to be a part of. Uh, and I will say after 19 years, it does not get old. It's never, it's never boring. It's never like, oh, it's just another future quest. Man, we look forward to this every year. Um, and the very first future quest I went to 19 years ago was as I was going into my senior year of high school. And then after that, I got to come as a volunteer and, and help in some areas. And um, so I got to this role now where I get to help, help direct this entire conference, um, in which we are working all year on it. We're already planning for next year's conference before this year even gets here. And it's really, really amazing. Over all those years, I was, I was doing the math, like, man, I have seen a couple tens of thousands of students come through here. I've prayed with a lot of them. I've spoken at workshops with some of them, had cool conversations with them on the patio about the things that the Lord was doing. And it's always been the heart and the vision of this conference. It was true before I came in and volunteered. It was true before I took over helping to direct it. The heart has always been, man, we want to create a space for young people to encounter Jesus, to be, to be filled, to be fueled. And as we were thinking about that, that's how we came up with our theme for this year. It was like, man, we actually, we're praying for that every single year. Let's focus on that and make that the theme for this year. And so I want to answer a question a lot of you have asked me. As a matter of fact, I've had cars just randomly like, slam on their brakes and stop me. Oh, John. I'm like, John, what? Like, am I about to get shot? John, what do the wristbands say? How many of you guys have wondered what is on your wristband? All right. I, I explained a couple of you guys. I'm just going to tell everyone now, so I don't have to keep repeating it. Um, we have a, a graphic designer who works with us for, with Future Quest uh, every year on all kinds of stuff. Really, really great dude. And so he sent me the mock-up for the wristband uh, and he, he gave me kind of like a zoomed out portion of it. And I realized it is the Fueled logo, but it's a zoomed in, a far zoomed in section. So you can't fully see all the letters all together. You're just seeing a chunk of the section of it. Um, so to answer that mystery, I just want to let you guys know. Um, and again, that is our theme for this year, Fueled. And in case you don't know, to be fueled means to be supplied, to be powered. It also means to burn more intensely. And, and thinking about it, it's like, that's it. That is what we pray for. That is what we're asking God for every year before Future Quest. And we've seen it. We've seen students come and be supplied by God's grace, empowered by his spirit, leaving more passionate than they came. However, we also know, and I know after all these years, some of your youth leaders can tell you, that's not always the end of the story. Because even though we've seen thousands and thousands, and we have, and it's really cool, it's profound, it's amazing every year, we've seen over those years thousands of students make significant decisions for Jesus. Some for the first time, some of them making rededications. Some of you guys did that last night or the first day. And, and these students leave pumped up excited, motivated. And it's always really encouraging. As a youth leader, I'm always so encouraged by those moments. So are yours. However, we also know that not all of them follow through. Not all of them leave future quests and continue walking with Jesus. And whatever happened here, at some point we look later on in their life and there's no evidence of what God did here. And I know because I talked with some of them, I prayed with some of them, some of them are people that I've mentored and am in close relationship with. I know that it's not that God didn't speak to them. It's not that they didn't have an experience with God. It's not that it wasn't real. It has nothing to do with that. 
Some of you guys might be like, oh, I know that. That has been me. I've done that. I went to a camp or I went to an event or I went to a future quest a few years ago and yeah, I was really pumped up. I made some decision. And then I went back and my life didn't really change. It didn't make a difference. I just went back to my old ways and I didn't really do much about it. Our focus when we put this conference together, which, uh, by the way, I, I mentioned like I helped direct it, but I'm just like a really small part. There are hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that make this conference happen. There are thousands of hours of work that go into it. And all of it, just so you guys know, our focus is not like, let's just have a really awesome youth conference. Um, we, hope, we hope it's great. We hope that you guys love it when you come. But our focus is always, what is going to happen after Future Quest? The focus of all of these three days is what are you going to do when you leave here? When we kick you guys out tonight, promptly, begging you to go home, we're going to wonder what's going to happen after this. What are you going to let God do with the things that he began here when you go home? Fueled. But for what? Fueled, filled up, supplied, empowered. But for what? The but is very important. Things as a youth pastor, you should not say to a room of junior high and high schoolers. The but is very important. Hey, son, daughter, what'd you guys learn at Future Quest? Well, the speaker told us this really profound thing. The but is very important. Fueled. But for what? As a matter of fact, it's so important that for the rest of this session, I'm going to say, we're going to practice some call and response. I'm going to say fueled, but... All right. We're going to do that, but not in that sleepy, weak way that just happened with just like a tiny portion of you. So every time that I say today, fueled, but... All right. Thank you. That's how that's going to go down. The but is important. I, I hear it. I keep saying it. I know. I'm sorry. Here's the thing. We really enjoy, we love the feeling of being filled up, of feeling empowered, motivated. God causes our hearts to burn more brightly for him. We get excited about him in some new ways. For some of you, some, a way that you've never been excited about God, motivated. Now, that doesn't sound like a problem, and it's not. The truth is, part of how God designed us is so that we would come alive in his presence. We were made to interact with him. And so it is exciting to be close to God. It is a unique and incredible and amazing feeling. Psalm 73, 28, it says, the nearness of God is my good. The psalmist is talking about, hey, sensing the nearness of God is amazing. I come alive in it, so do you. The problem, though, lies with the fact that sometimes we think that feeling, the motivation, the, the being pumped up, the, yeah, Jesus, we think that feeling is the goal or that's supposed to be the outcome. We think that Future Quest is just supposed to be this, this cool memory that we have. Fueled, but... Thank you. Shout out to that guy who's on it. The rest of you guys need to step your game up. So what do we do then? This like empowerment, this excitement, this passion. God's doing something. It's really obvious. It's obvious just in, in the way that you guys are worshiping. Like right now coming out here is like kind of painful. Like, man, I don't want to stop worship. I just want to keep doing what we're doing because it's really, it's really clear like, man, God is doing something because the way that these students are engaging in worship, the way that they are excited to be in the presence of God right now is different than even just it was two days ago. And for some of you guys, that's a new experience. You've never felt excitement to worship or you've never chosen to be engaged or to participate and you are. What do you do with that passion, that focus, that conviction? Because the truth is this, you can't, you can't store that in a memory box. Just writing it down in a journal isn't going to do it justice. We encourage you regularly, hey, you should tell someone, tell your friends, tell a youth leader, tell your parents what's going on. But that in itself is not enough. 
Sharing a post on social media, hashtag FQ conference, is not going to make the difference for you. Just wearing your Future Quest t-shirt around, which uh, it seems like you guys are into those, I'm glad, it's rad seeing those around. Just that is not going to change your life in some way when you leave here. Fueled, but I want you guys to think about that. Now, here's the thing, spoiler alert. I can't answer that question for you. Good luck, message over, I'm gonna go, figure it out. Thank you, thank you. I can't answer that. I don't know what God is fueling you for. I don't know what he's calling you to. I don't know the things that he's gonna direct you towards and convict you of, the things that he's already putting on your mind and on your heart. Some of you guys, when you left the first day or yesterday, maybe during worship today, there are things that God is stirring up. There are actions that he's calling you to take or maybe to refrain from. God is doing some fueling over these three days. Hopefully in this session, more tonight, a lot of you are going to experience some of the nearness of God today. Some of you already have, and I believe God's going to do, he's going to encourage you, he's going to fill you. And the best thing that you guys can do is invite God to show you Ask him, God, what are you fueling me for? What are you wanting to do with this time? What are you wanting to do with these three days? I feel motivated. I feel pumped up. I feel excited. I sense your presence. What are you calling me to do? Throughout history, God's given us examples of people that he has motivated, filled, empowered, fueled, and called out. And he's shown us what happens when they walk with him when they walk in obedience to what he's called them to. And so today, briefly, I just want to look at one of those people. I want to talk about our boy Moses. Moses is someone I know a lot of you guys are familiar with. Moses was an Israelite who happened to be raised in Egypt. And his people, the Israelites, were all slaves in Egypt. Egypt being this massive, powerful empire, the Israelites were just their slaves. They just did whatever they needed. They worked really, really hard. In Exodus 2, 23 through 25, it gives us some background into what's going on. It says, the sons of Israel groaned because of the bondage that they were under. They cried out. They were not having a good time. Their cry for help because of their bondage ascended to God. So God heard their groaning. God saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. Now, we're not, we're not talking about Moses yet. We're talking about Israel. We're talking about the fact that God sees Israel, the problem they're having. He is moved by compassion for them. They're crying out to him. God was working and preparing, seeing what's going on before Moses had any idea what God was doing. And so as we talk about the things that God is fueling you for and calling you to, I want to tell you, God knows what he is fueling you for, even if you don't. You don't have to know right now what what that thing is. But God knows exactly what he's fueling you for. He knows his purposes and intentions for these three days and how he wants to direct you. That's a cool thing. I will tell you, you can talk to any of your youth leaders. Anybody who's been walking with Jesus for a while knows that they can look back on their life and know that there there were moments where they realized God knew exactly what he was doing even when they had no idea. There were things that they didn't see, they didn't understand at the time, and now they look back and we're like, oh, God was working and doing some stuff, and I didn't figure it out till five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later. God knows what he's fueling you for, even if you don't. The things that he's preparing you for and equipping you for and sending you guys towards. And when you see it, it's glorious. It's incredible. And so God calls Moses. A lot of you guys are familiar with the story. He speaks to him through a, a burning bush, some miraculous, crazy thing. God speaks to Moses so Moses can hear his voice. It's this really incredible, profound, holy moment that Moses has with God. God tells him, Moses, here's what I'm calling you to. Here's what, I, here's what I'm going to send you to do. Here's what I'm calling you to accomplish. And Moses Exodus 4.10 says to the Lord, Lord, I'm not eloquent. I haven't been in the past, and right now, I'm not eloquent. 
I wasn't before and I'm not now. I'm slow of speech and of tongue. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes people mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and I'll teach you what you shall speak. God told Moses really clearly, here's what I'm calling you to. And Moses is like, wait, 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 but God, you don't understand. We're good at this. We, we do the same things. I, I read things in the Old Testament and sometimes I get frustrated like, man, God, like your people are dumb sometimes. And at some point, God convicted me and was like, you are just like them. You do all these same things that Israel does in the Old Testament. I respond just like Moses did. God calls me to something, and I'm like, God, I'm not the right guy. Like, you got the wrong one. Someone else should do that. The things that God calls us to, we're quick to doubt. God, I don't know if I can cut off that relationship. God, I, I don't know if I can actually wake up earlier, set an alarm to try to make time with you, some kind of priority in my life. I'm really busy. God, I don't know. I don't know that I can invite that friend to church. God, I don't know that I can give up this sport that's become an idol in my life and take in your place. God, I don't know if I can confess or admit what's going on with me and be honest with someone. God, I don't know if I can be a leader or serve in ministry. God, I, I don't think I'm the one to witness to my family, to talk to people about Jesus. I want to say this. When God is fueling you and calling you to something, God doesn't accept our excuses. God didn't accept Moses' excuse. God reassured him. God reassured him that he would work through him as long as he was willing. And Moses went and God was with him. But it's not about what you feel ready for. It's not about what you feel prepared for or how confident you feel. It's about what God can do through you when you let him, when you're willing to let him fuel you and call you and to walk in obedience. And so Moses complained, God, I, I don't talk good. And God's like, all right, Moses, I'm going to help you out. He just did miracles in front of Moses, multiple miracles. Uh, and Moses is like, yeah, God, I don't know. Like, I don't know that I have what it takes. And God's like, all right. Clearly in a demonstration of grace and patience, he's like, all right, I'll let Aaron help you out then since you don't trust me that I can help you do it on your own. So God brings him Aaron. Aaron helps. Um, God shows this grace to Moses. Now, here's the thing. Moses should have known better. Moses should have responded better because, again, God's just like, hey, let me do a few miracles in front of you real quick. He does them. And after that, Moses is still like, yeah, God, I don't know. He should have responded better. He didn't. A really cool moment in here, though, is God's patience and grace with him. And God's like, all right, you, you should have gotten it. You should have just said okay and been obedient and trusted I'll be with you. But you know what? I'll help you. I'll, I'll send Aaron anyways. Many of us have a struggle, a question, a doubt. And sometimes we're just like, all right, I guess I just can't. I'm out. I'm not the person, God. You need to find someone else. God does not accept our excuses, but he is patient and he's gracious with us. Now, I want you to know this. God doesn't call you to things because you're ready for him. He doesn't call you to things because you're already equipped and you're the, you're the obvious person for the job. He equips you because you're called. He's going to call you and then he's going to equip you to do what he's calling you for. He's going to give you what you need. And so that whatever it is that God's putting on your heart, maybe already the last couple days or maybe it's something today, whatever it is that God is stirring you towards, just know he is going to equip you for whatever that call is. He will give you what you need. He will fuel you to accomplish his will. And so then after that moment, Moses and Aaron are like, all right, we got this. We're ready. We got the tag team. God's calling us to do this thing. And so in Exodus 4, 28 through 31, Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord which he had sent to, with which he had sent him. 
and all the signs that he commanded him to do. So Moses and Aaron went, and they assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. And he performed the signs in, front, in the sight of the people. And so the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them, the sons of Israel, that he had seen their affliction, they bowed low and they worshipped. What They came and they told everybody what God was planning to do, how God had called them. And the response was, it burst out into a worship service of them praising God. I want to let you guys know, when you respond to what God is fueling you for, God will be glorified. God is going to use whatever the things are that he's putting on your heart to do, it's going to make him look good. God's going to be glorified in it. And that's not just in the big grandiose things. It's not just because they're like about to go rescue a whole nation from slavery. The things that God calls you to might in your eyes seem small or like not a big deal, like it's not going to affect other people. But every single step of obedience that you take furthers the kingdom of God by allowing him to work in you and through you. There are things that God wants to accomplish around you and it, whether or not that's going to happen is going to be dependent on whether or not you are willing to take a step of obedience to let God be glorified through you. And so all the people, they hear what's going on. They're excited. They're like, yes, God's going to save us. This is amazing. We're, we're watching these guys do miracles. Like this is going to be crazy. And so Moses and Aaron, they go and they deliver this message to Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. They're like, hey, here's what God says. Like, you better do what he says. It does not go how they think it's going to go. Pharaoh's not like, okay, cool. I'm not messing with God. Like, go ahead. He's like, who, who do you think you are? Like little cockroaches coming to me. Like, I'm going to do anything for you. And so as a matter of fact, Pharaoh gets mad and he decides, not only am I not going to let you go, I'm going to make all of your lives harder. You guys are, are laboring, slaving away in the, in the hot sun all day, making bricks, which that was their labor. He's like, not only are you going to keep making bricks all day in the hot sun, I'm not even going to give you the supplies that you need to make the bricks. Now you better go find the supplies yourself. But if you don't make the daily quota of bricks, just know some bad things are going to happen to you. And so it does not go how they think. They think, all right, God's calling us. We're going to go do this thing. He showed us the miracles. Like, let's go. They go and deliver it. And the very first thing they encounter is opposition. If you want to walk out the things that God's calling you to, the things that he's fueling you for, just know you can't be surprised when opposition arises. Don't be surprised. Don't let it catch you off guard. I'm going to tell you right now, if you decide, I want to leave Future Quest and I want to walk out these things that God's stirring up in me, I want to be obedient to it, which obviously this whole time, I'm going to convince you why that is the best thing for you and this world, but you can't be surprised when opposition arises. The enemy does not want you to walk in the things that God's calling you for. As a matter of fact, Satan's name literally means accuser or adversary. He is your enemy. He hates that you bear the image of God. He does not want you discovering the things that God is fueling you for and calling you towards. And so the moment you start trying to do that, there will be opposition. And I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know how that's going to come. But I want to, I want to tell you guys, do not be surprised. 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There will be opposition. And that's not that you did something wrong. It's not that God didn't call you. It's not that you made a mistake. It's that we have an enemy who does not want you to walk in the things that God's calling you for because he knows what you can accomplish when you give your life to him, when you're walking in obedience and God is fueling you and calling you to things. He knows what kind of damage can be done for the kingdom of God, and he is going to try to slow you down and stop you and discourage you. And so, continuing with the story, now the Israelites are mad at Moses and Aaron. Hey, you said God spoke to you and was going to like deliver us, and now our work is way harder, and life sucks, and this is your fault. They were not happy. In Exodus 5, 20, 22 through 23, 
It says, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? What were you thinking, God? Why, why did you do this to me? Why did you put me in this position? He says, ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people. And you have not rescued your people at all. When we think of Moses, we don't often think of like this moment. What are you doing, God? You didn't do what you said you were going to do. I stuck my neck out for you. I took this risk. You, you told me that you were going to equip me and you were going to use me and good things were going to happen and we were going to be free. You haven't rescued your people at all. Now, we have moments just like this one Moses had. I've had moments like this moment that Moses has. And here's how it often goes when God calls us to something and we take a step of faith and of obedience. God, you told me to break up with my boyfriend or girlfriend and I did it. And now I'm just lonely and I don't feel any better because of it. God, you told me to witness to my friends or to invite that person to church and they didn't come. They just, they laughed at me and ignored me and now they don't want to hang out with me. God, you told me to cut off this thing or to cut off this person, but it's hard. It's not easy. I still struggle with it every day. God, I, I confess that sin that you told me to confess, and now I'm grounded and, and people are mad at me. Moses is complaining that God hasn't rescued them yet. Now, a, a lot of you guys know that's not how the story ends, not even close. The history of the Israelites and Egypt ends very differently. We're not going to get into all of it, but you have to know God did everything that he said he was going to do and more. God did. He delivered them. He rescued them. He came through more miraculously and incredibly than any of them could have imagined. If they wrote down their ideas for all the crazy ways that God could free them and save them, I don't think any of them could have come up with the way that God actually did come through. It's so crazy. It's so amazing and profound that right now, thousands of years later, in a different continent on this planet, we are talking about this story of what God did and how he delivered them. We have to trust God for the timing and the final outcome. Because if you want to respond to the things that God's calling you to, I want to say this, things might not happen as quickly as you want. It might not go down the way that you are expecting it to go down when you decide to be obedient to God. But I want to tell you this, you will never be disappointed that you trusted God. You will never be disappointed for continuing to respond to what he's fueling you for. Because in God's timing, he will take care of the outcome. If you're being faithful and obedient, he's gonna fuel you and lead you and the outcome is gonna be, he's glorified and you're gonna be like, wow, that was better than I could have thought. That was bigger than I could have imagined. Trust him for the timing and the outcome. We're going to continue looking at Israel here in Exodus 6, verses 6 through 7. God gives Moses a message for the people. This is in the midst of things aren't going great. It, you know, Pharaoh's not happy. They're not free yet at this point. And God tells them, say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I'm the Lord and I'm going to bring you out from under the labor of the Egyptians. I'm going to rescue you from their bondage. I'm going to redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgments. I'm going to take you as my people. I'm going to be your God. And then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the labors of the Egyptians. And so Moses delivered this, said this to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses. So it didn't work out how he thought. And he's like, no, guys, God told me. God called me, I'm telling you, this is what God instructed me. And they're like, eh, I don't know about that. Maybe not, Moses. I want to tell you, if you want to respond to what God is fueling you for, don't be surprised or discouraged when other people don't get it. The other Israelites didn't get it because they didn't get that word from God that Moses got. Moses relayed it to them. Now, they should have trusted. God had already proved himself in all kinds of ways to them. But 
They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. Do not be surprised or discouraged when other people don't get it. God's going to fuel you guys for a purpose. He's going to direct you. He's going to lead you. And it might be different. The people who didn't experience what you experienced, who didn't receive the conviction or the direction that you did, there will be some people who weren't here these three days, and they're not going to understand the decision that you want to make. They're not going to understand why you want to be so serious about God all of a sudden. They're not going to understand why you want to shift your priorities around or why you can't hang out with them anymore. Don't let this stop you. I know it can be tough when you're really passionate about something, you're fired up, and you're like, yeah, I want to do this thing. And other people are like, why? That's weird. Like, calm down. Sometimes it's even Christians who are like, ah, that's like too much. You're doing too much. Don't be discouraged when others don't get it. The best thing that you guys can do here at Future Quest is invite God to show you, what are you fueling me for? Maybe it's living out of response to some truth that he revealed to you. Maybe it was on day one, Chris spoke about acknowledging and trusting God in hard times. Christopher Yuan yesterday talked about walking out and staking your identity in Christ and not your gender or sexuality or anything else, but letting Christ be the foundation of your life. And so maybe it's walking that out. Maybe it's confessing a sin. Maybe it's taking a step of faith and action. Maybe it's reprioritizing your time and your schedule. Because if you're honest, some of you, this conference might be the first time your youth leader has seen you or heard from you in the last six months because you heard something fun was going on and you showed up. Maybe it's the truth that you heard in a workshop and some specific area of your life where you felt challenged to take some step, to make a decision, to walk something out. Fueled, but? Nope, nope. That, that's not going to work. Guys, fueled, but? Thank you. Now, again, the purpose of all this, it's not so that we just come and feel warm and fuzzy and just feel, like, yeah, now I feel like a lot closer to my friends. Um, that's a cool thing. That's a cool byproduct. The closer we get to Jesus, the closer we get to his people. It's cool to have fun memories, but... That's not why this exists. It's not just so that we can have a spiritual highlight, a spiritual moment. It's so that you can go back and live the rest of your life responding to what God fueled you for here these three days. Because there are good works. Ephesians 2.10 says there are good works that God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. God is readying you and he already knows the things that he's calling you to. He wants to empower you and direct you to walk with him. And the thing is that often happens on an individual level. Like, sure, there are things that we should all do. We should all go to church. We should all read our Bible. We should all pray. We should all worship. But there are going to be some specific things in addition to those things that God is calling you to, that he's putting on your heart, that he's speaking to you about. Some of that's already happening. Fuel, but? That's the question. What is God fueling you for? Uh, a fun fact about me, um, I don't have a lot of hobbies. Some people are like big hobby people. My brother has a new hobby every single week. There's like a couple things I like. One of the things that I enjoy doing is shooting guns. I think guns are like just a kind of crazy machine. Um, and the fact that we can uh, legally own them and, and use them is uh, a cool thing to me. A gun is a force to be reckoned with. It's part of why I like shooting stuff, because it's like this marvel of like what this thing in my hands is accomplishing to that target or whatever it is that I happen to be shooting. Now, I also know, I have a few guns. A gun in itself, while it's a pretty crazy machine, has no power in itself. It's really just a like engineered chunk of metal with some springs and, and mechanisms in it. A bullet, a bullet in itself actually doesn't have any real power. A bullet is just the tip at the end of a cartridge that hits. And generally the bullet is what does, does damage, but the bullet has no power in itself. I could flick a bullet at you and it's just gonna be a little hunk of metal. 
The power in a gun lays in the gunpowder that is in the cartridge that the bullet is attached to. Now, to show you guys the power of gunpowder, I brought some. I want to demonstrate. Um, I want to say, if, if all of you young people are clapping like that, I don't know if that's a really good idea or a really bad idea, but I do want to demonstrate it. I want to, I want to show you some things. Now, the way... Shh, the way that a, a cartridge works is it's filled with gunpowder, there's a primer, and then the bullet, which is the, the tip on the end that goes. And I'm gonna show you an example. This is an easy one, because it's a really big one. This is a 50 caliber BMG cartridge here. This is the bullet, this part. In here, this part of the cartridge is filled with gunpowder. Now, this is a massive cartridge. A lot of them are a lot smaller than this. Uh, one of the smallest bullets, uh, 22, would be like maybe to here and very, very skinny. You wouldn't even see it up here. That's why I'm holding this up. Now, the way that, the way that a, a cartridge like this is fired is there's a certain measurement of gunpowder that has to go in it. That provides the power, sends the bullet to do the destroying or whatever what have you. And so I brought a handy dandy. I have a weird drug dealer looking scale here. It's actually for measuring gunpowder. And the way that this works is like this. Gunpowder, again, it's measured in grains. I have, this is a canister of gunpowder. You can buy these. I think you have to be over 18, so I don't have any ideas. Students, this is a canister of gunpowder. It's just normal gunpowder bought it at a store. It's for reloading bullets. And so again, bullets are measured in grain. So 22, pr pretty much the smallest bullet that you would shoot by. People bought by just to like kick around. You can maybe shoot rabbits, hit small targets. Oh, that's even too much. Hold on. It's, it's typically like two grains. I don't know that you guys are going to be able to see this super, super clearly here. Let me uh, turn that. You can't. There's a reason you can't. Because two grains is like a tiny pinch of gunpowder. It's like nothing. I could just, psh, two grains of gunpowder does nothing. Now, a standard a handgun, like a nine millimeter handgun, which is fairly standard, that bullet is going to have about five grains of gunpowder. And so that's 5.9. That's a lot more. But that's like two or three tiny pinches of gunpowder. Now, a someone in the military would have a rifle, they call it M4, think like an AR-15, and the, the round that they shoot is 5.56, five, um, and that round has about 29 grains of gunpowder in it. So for, I want to have the power of a round like that, which again, that's what our military uses. I'm not exact. I'm at 30-something right now. I'm over. It's still not really a serious amount in this tiny little thing. It's just covering the bottom of this small thing I have here. Now, if I were to shoot a shotgun shell, a shotgun slug, now some of you guys have no reference for these things, and that's okay, I don't expect that you guys are out shooting guns, um, but I did this last week, I was like, I called a student up, I was like, hey, I need to go shoot some stuff for Future Quest. Do you want to come with me? Um, and so he came with me and recorded me shooting a shotgun slug. The target was a watermelon. I want to show you what it looks like when a shotgun slug hits a watermelon. Now, we were both right there. He was filming on one side. I'm shooting on the other side. We're both covered in watermelon juice. Let's look, look, at, look at that again. It's just, it's vaporized. There's a couple pieces of rind on the ground afterwards, but we basically had to clean up nothing because it was just obliterated. So that's a, that's a shotgun shell round with a, a slug round. And that is about 50 grains of gunpowder. So on that 32, I'm going to add a little bit more here. And I'm going to get us to, we're almost there. I'm at 55. I'm not worried about it because it's still not that much gunpowder. But what that gunpowder can do is a pretty crazy thing. Now, let's get to the fun stuff. This 
is a 50 caliber BMG bullet. Now, what these are designed for is to penetrate light armor in aircraft, in military vehicles like trucks, in armored personnel carriers, other hard targets and equipment. And this, the, the normal effective range for this is like 1,800 yards that it can travel and still destroy things. So they use this to like shoot down airplanes and to destroy boats. These have about 220 grains of gunpowder. So I'm going to come over here. We're at 55. I just got to start dumping stuff in here. We're at 150 to 221. All right. Now we're like four-fifths of the way full, this thing here. And I don't expect you to be able to see this. That's okay that you can't see this. So if we're at like four-fifths of the way full here, I want to show you real quick, what, what is this capable of? What would it look like to shoot this at something? I want to show you an example real quick. There's a guy here, this guy on YouTube, he's crazy, he's shooting all kinds of stuff. He's shooting at three steel beams back to back. In total, over half of an inch thick of steel. Let's see it. Okay, fire now. Huh. <laughs> that one, the one in That's the, the second caliber. one. And here's what happened. That was the green tip, and here's the uh, army piercing, the black tip. It looks like it went in two different sections. Piece it broke in, over here, up, it broke in half. And the other piece went straight in. Made a hole inside. Just really give me a close up on the back. <sighs> Look at that. All right, so that's half an inch thick steel and it split up and it broke in half and still managed to get through that third steel plate. That is this amount of gunpowder right here. I'm gonna pour that right there. So that's one 50 caliber bullet. That's about four fifths of this. That's what one, one of these bullets can do. I'm gonna, this is not how you do this by the way, uh, but this is what we're doing. So here's, here's a second one. Some people are cringing right now like, bro, you should not be handling gunpowder like that. And you are right. That is not how you do this. Here's a third. All right, so we have three 50 caliber bullets worth of gunpowder right here on this plate. I want to say there's something that kind of crazy that happens when you are a pastor. People just let you do things that you have no business doing. I'm not an explosive expert or a gun expert, um, but they're like, oh yeah, he's a pastor, so he must know what he's doing. Uh, I don't. I haven't okayed this with like a security team or whatever. However, I'm not a total idiot. I have gloves and a mask because I want to know what can this gunpowder do when you light it on fire? If one, if one 50 caliber bullet can do that, what can three of them do? I want to find out. Again, not an idiot. All right, we ready? What does three... 50 caliber bullets worth of gunpowder do when you light it on fire. Hold on, hold on. Did you guys see that video that I just showed you? That is a 50 caliber bullet blowing through that half inch thick steel through those three steel beams, that was three of those worth of gunpowder. Again, I told you guys, power, the power is not in the bullet itself. The bullet is just a metal tip. All of the power is in the gunpowder. 
That was three of those. So the question is this, is that fake gunpowder? Or did I lie to you? Is that a, a dummied up video about the power of a 50 caliber bullet? No, it's real gunpowder. I bought it from a gun store locally. I, I weighed out on that scale gunpowder enough to fill three of these 50 caliber bullets, which again, they use to shoot down aircraft and army personnel vehicles. The issue is this. While gunpowder is tremendously powerful, the potential of it is only unleashed when it's channeled and focused and directed. Just like this out in the open, although all of the power to do what that did is there, it's, it's unfocused. It's not, it's not going towards any one thing. And so it just burns up in a second, bam, gone. I could have brought some flash paper and just lit some paper on fire and it'd be like, and then be over. Again, when I, when, before I even experimented with this, I was like, am I going to blow myself up? It's like something really, should I not do this in a room full of youth? And then I learned, oh, gunpowder on its own, just out in the open, doesn't do much. It is the pressure and the direction created in this cartridge that enables a bullet to have the power that it has to be the destructive force that it is. And I bring that up for this point, to say this. God is all-powerful. God can do anything that he wants, yet he chooses to empower us. He chooses to channel his power through us to accomplish far more than we are capable of on our own. A bullet on its own is just a hunk of metal. I could throw this at you and it might be like, ah, oh, that like didn't feel good. You're messed up. But it wouldn't do anything. It is the power channeling behind it, sending it out, that makes it a force to be reckoned with. You don't mess with 50 caliber bullets. God is all powerful and he can do anything he wants. He doesn't need us. But what he does is he chooses to unleash his power in the world through us. He chooses to use us to be vessels. He fuels us and calls us. And if we aren't willing to go, then God is like, all right, I'm going to have to choose another vessel then. I'm wanting to unleash some power in your family and at your school and in your youth group, but I want to bring it through you. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to hear my call and take steps of faith and obedience so that I can unleash you to do some, to, to be a force for the kingdom of God? And that doesn't, you could be 12 and be a force for the kingdom of God when the power of God is working through you. Or you can be 18 and be a force for the kingdom of God when the power of God is working through you. Fueled, but... That's the question. What is God fueling you for? He will fuel you. I want to I wanna bring up one example. I have a, a student. He's actually in this room. I didn't tell him I'm going to talk about him, and that's fine. Um, he came up to me after a camp that we had, and he was like, hey, God's like doing something in me, and I have this conviction I'm supposed to do something at my school. I, I need to start a Christian club at my public high school and I need to do something to try to reach people for Jesus. And um, it's, it's fair to say, this student, he knows I love him. He's not going to be offended. He's not a, a Bible scholar. He's not the most just natural born leader. Everybody's doing what he says. He's just a 16-year-old a kid who's like, God's calling me to do something. I, need, I feel like I need to step up. I feel like I know what God's calling me to. I have this conviction. He, he was honest with me. He's like, I don't want to. There's a part of me that feels like it shouldn't be me. I don't really have a desire to do that, but God's doing this thing in me and calling me to do this. And so I'm like, all right, like, I, I want to help you. Um, uh, part of what our, our ministry is that we want to help support our students on campus clubs. Youth leaders, if you can support your students and be on their campus, it's tremendous. That's what UIC does, who I, I mentioned and promoted you guys earlier. So this student, feeling fueled by God, felt he needed to start a Christian club. And so he pursued it. He kept following up with me and asking me, all right, what's the next step? What do I do here? How do I go about this? And he has to go to the school. He has to make multiple trips to the school office before school, after school, fill out paperwork. And I want to say this, the school didn't make it easy for him. He could have easily been like, all right, never mind. 
that's too much work. This is annoying. I'm not doing it. He kept doing it. The school drug out this process. It was very, very tedious. It didn't start when we wanted it to start. However, at the end of the year, we got the club started, all because this kid said, all right, God, how can I direct what you're fueling me for? During, during the months of that club, we saw a bunch of students come through those doors. We averaged between like 30 and 40-something students every week at this public high school. And a number of, a number of those students <laughs> who had never made a decision for Jesus, they, they came to the first day of club asking like, what is this? What is this club about? And we're like, oh, it's a Christian club. And they're like, you mean like God and Jesus and the Bible and stuff? No framework whatsoever for Christianity. And some of those students made decisions over those months to give their life to Jesus and to walk with them. At the end of the year, we got feedback from these. We just asked them, like, hey, we want to know, you know, what did you guys think about club this year? And we had some of the responses. And reading through these, is this crazy testament and reminder to me of like, man, when God fuels you, when God calls you to something, you don't know how he can use it. You don't know what he's waiting to do if you would just take a step. Junior higher, high schooler, adults, when God is fueling you and calling you to something, you have no idea what he can unleash when you are willing to respond. Feedback for this club it's a whole myriad of responses. Some of them are, are honestly just like really cute. Um, but these are all high school students who just like on their own decided to give us this feedback. Thankful for this club for making my relationship with God. My absolute favorite aspect of this club was being able to fellowship with friends and venture into the word of God. And it's nice knowing I have people my age going through the same journey as me. So grateful for the change and in insight this club has brought me each week. I haven't been in this club before, but I think this club helps people grow not only with God, but with each other. I learned a lot, and my relationship with the Lord has grown tremendously over the past few months. This club has helped me with talking to God, and it's helped me open myself up to other people, and it's helped me grow a new family. I like how some people treated me good. I think this club is great for those who are trying to begin their relationship with, with God, this club was a reminder that God was looking over me and wants a greater relationship with me. Just some of the random feedback. Because a 16-year-old kid said, God's fueling me for something. What do I do with this? Fueled, but for what? And decided to take some steps and not be discouraged and not give up, but trust that God was going to do something. And the outcome is God was glorified and did more than he or I could have asked or expected. Future Quest is not about this flash in the pan moment of just like, hey, cool, something happened. I want to invite you guys to ask God, what are you calling me to? What steps do you want me to take? How can I be obedient to what you are showing me? Because again, you can be a force for the kingdom of God because of his power that works in you and through you if you're willing. Fueled, but... I want to, I'm going to ask you guys to do something with me. I want to pray for us because that question of fueled, but for what? It's a great question. I hope you remember it. I hope it sticks in your mind that I made you keep repeating this thing over and over. Sky talking about butts from the stage of Future Quest. <laughs> However, it, the question only matters if you can answer it. You got to know, what is God fueling me for? What is he doing here? What does he want to do with my life when I leave Future Quest? I want to pray for that. I want to pray that God would speak to us and convict us and bring to mind the things that he's been doing over these few days. And he still has more. He's going to do more when you leave here and go to your next workshop today. He's going to do more tonight when we're worshiping him and hearing his word again. Maybe when you respond in prayer. We still have plenty of opportunities. So if you're like, hey, I don't know the answer to that question yet, that's okay. God has more for you. I believe for every one of you, he wants to help you answer that question. And I wanna pray for that. I wanna pray that God would speak to us clearly, that he would help us to know what is he calling us for. 
And as I pray, I want to do this. Some of you already know. Some of you, it was obvious the very first day, God convicted you, God put something on your heart, an idea that you can't shake. Maybe you already talked to your youth leader about it, but some of you know exactly what God is fueling you for, for Beyond Future Quest. As we all, as we all bow our heads and pray together, if you know what God is fueling you for, if you can answer that question, fueled, but for what? As I pray, I want to invite you guys to just stand up. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to look at you. No one's going to notice other than me. Because if you stand up, I want to say a special prayer for you guys. For the rest of us, I'm going to pray God would show us. But if you already know, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace and your help. Thank you that we were created for your purposes, designed to be used by you, designed to know you and to enjoy you and to bring you glory. God, thank you for the things that you are doing this week. But Lord, we want to know, what are you calling us to? How do we respond? How do we text, take steps faithfully beyond these three days? Lord, thank you that you meet us, that you draw near to us, but what are you calling us to? Lord, I pray that you would show us. I pray that you would give us conviction and clarity. Make us aware, Lord, of the things that you're calling us to. Those of you guys who already know, again, I want to invite you guys to stand up because I want to pray over you. If you know the things that God's calling you for, you know the things that he's directing you to do after these three days, I want to pray for you. Lord, for those standing right now, thank you. Thank you for the, the seeds that you've planted. Thank you for the direction that you're giving. I pray that the enemy wouldn't be able to snatch it away, Lord, but it would burn in their hearts. That they would talk about it and remember it and meditate on it and pray about it. And that you'd give them the boldness and the courage and the faith to take the steps needed, Lord, when these three days are over. Anoint them and fill them, empower them, fuel them, equip them for all the things that you have beyond these three days for them. Lord, thank you. And for all of us, God, all the rest of us, we want to know, keep speaking to us, keep making it clear, God, what do you have for us beyond this? How do we respond? How can we be obedient so that your power can be unleashed through us? Thank you for your grace that you're patient with us in our shortcomings, even when we don't get it right the first time. Pray that we be motivated and excited for all that you have ahead. In your name, amen.